Gracious Father in heaven, we did come to you today, and I plead that you'll just give me um, words to say and the way to say them, Lord. Um, tempered by your Holy Spirit, nothing that we say of ourselves matters anyway. It's only through your Spirit, Lord. Help us to uplift Christ in everything we do, to hide behind the cross and not ourselves. So this is my prayer for myself for today. Help me and bless me in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 closed for public affairs because of COVID, but now they're open and the natural scenic beauty is just really worth the trip. So I urge you, if you can, to do that. Perhaps we can think about that for our young people one of these days. Uh, years ago, when they first uh, started developing um, and exploring the cave system in the mid-1950s, a human skeleton was found reclining in one of those dark rooms. You can understand how easy it would be to become hopelessly lost without a guide and without good lighting. As it is, close head counts now are done, and the guides give detailed instructions. Everyone has to follow the instructions of the guide closely. So it is for the travelers in this world of sin. There is no chance for us to get um, through the dark wilderness alone. We need the light of God's word and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. God sent his spirit to guide us on this important journey. 
if we attempt to walk independently of him, we shall stumble into the deep darkness of eternal night. Shortly before his crucifixion, our Savior made a precious promise. It was this, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever, John 14, 16. Then he declared that he would return to his father. In spite of this promise, um, the disciples were despondent, discouraged, sorrowful. Then he explained why it was necessary for him to go away, John 16, 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. So we see that the Holy Spirit came to comfort God's people and is really the true representative of Christ on earth, the continued life of Jesus. It's actually written in Scripture, the Lord is that Spirit. 2 Corinthians 3.17. Now we find that the Holy Spirit has been at work in the world from the beginning. And it's first mentioned in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, where we read, The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. We read that the Holy Spirit in Isaiah uh, chapter 40, uh, verse 13, is at work in other places throughout the Old Testament. He inspired the prophets. He led his people and guided them. No one can flee from the presence of the Holy Spirit. Psalms 139, verse 7. How then is it that Jesus speaks of the Spirit coming after his departure? <clears throat> For he says, if I go not away, the Comforter will not come. How is it that the Apostle John tells us that the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified? John 7, 39. The answer is that after Jesus was crucified, he went back to heaven and sat at the right hand of God. The Holy Spirit came in a new way. He came as the representative of Christ <clears throat> He is the true representative of Christ. Some people take the title of Vicar of Christ, but whatever title, the Holy Spirit represents, he's the true representative of Jesus on earth now. The Holy Spirit no longer operates independently, but uh, he speaks for Christ to testify of Christ, to be the head of the church. To show the church the things of Christ. To dwell in the hearts of the people in Christ's name. And so exalt the name and power of our wonderful Savior. In fact, speaking of the coming of the Comforter, Jesus says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. John 14, 18. It is through the Holy Spirit that Christ dwells in the hearts of the believers. For we read in Romans chapter 8, verse 9, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Notice how important it is that we believe in and accept the presence and work of the Holy Spirit of God, a third person of the Holy Trinity. Jesus said, He shall testify of me, John 15, 26. He shall not speak of himself. Whatsoever he hears, that shall he speak. He shall glorify me, for that he shall receive of mine and show it unto you, John 16, 13. But that's, that's not all. Turn to John 14, 26. 
but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, when the Father will send, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall lead you and teach you all things that, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Now that's the work of the Holy Spirit. HMS Richards tells a story uh, about a guide in the deserts of Arabia years ago. They called him the Dove Man. He is said to never lose his way. How did he do it? He carried in his breast a homing pigeon. He had a very fine cord attached to it. And whenever in doubt as to which way to take, the guide threw the bird into the air and the homing dove quickly strained at the cord to fly in the direction of home. That's how his master knew unerringly the direction to take. No wonder they referred to him as a dove man. So the Holy Spirit, the heavenly dove, is not only able but willing to lead us in the right way, to guide us at last to our eternal home. Please remember that at the baptism of our sa baptism of our Savior, the Holy Spirit appeared in bodily form as a dove, gliding upon the head of Christ. And the voice of God declared, "This was His beloved Son." In Acts chapter ten, verse thirty-eight, we find this: how that quote, God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost. This was the anointing of Christ for his ministry. And united with the Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost, the word ghost is the old English word for spirit. He was given unlimited measure of the Holy Spirit. Listen to Martin Luther concerning the Holy Spirit. The believing man hath the Holy Ghost. Where the Holy Ghost dwells, he will not suffer a man to be idle, but stir him up to all exercises of piety and godliness, of true religion, to the love of God, with patience, suffering of afflictions, to prayer, to thanksgiving, to the exercise of charity toward all men. It's true that the Holy Spirit came in a mighty, powerful way on the day of Pentecost. They went forward and preached and stirred the world up with the gospel. Hearts were changed. Thousands died as martyrs, but nothing could resist the Christian message in spirit-filled hearts. H.M.S. Richards, again, one of my favorite all-time authors, asked, what's the matter with us today? Then he quotes Q.T. Kerr, who said, we have substituted relativity for reality, psychology for prayer, and inferiority complex for sin, social control for family worship, auto-suggestion for conversion, reflex action for revelation, the spirit of the wheels for the power of the spirit. In the House of Representatives in Washington, D.C., there sits in the speaker's desk, a man who knows parliamentary law, a real master of it. The speaker may sometimes be too lost to know the proper procedure in some parliamentary tangle. He may not know what to do, but this expert knows exactly what should be done. Without being asked, he whispers a solution to his superior. He anticipates difficult situations and has an instantly ready answer. Jesus said, I will send you another comforter. And the word used here in the Greek is paraclete, which is really a combination of two words meaning uh, called to stand by, like the man at the speaker's side. Ready at all times of perplexity, so the Holy Spirit who came at Pentecost stands by to give his counsel. He shall teach you all things and bring to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. 
He will guide you into all truth. John 16, 13. Let us not forget that the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, and He also is the author of the Scriptures, for holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. So whatever the counsel of, counsel of the Holy Spirit uh, He gives to our own hearts, it will always be in harmony with what He has already said in the Holy Scriptures. When He has come, <clears throat> I'm sorry. When He has come, Jesus said, He will reprove and convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment, John 16, 8. Conviction of sin comes through the Holy Spirit. We need to be careful that we do not grieve the Spirit so we have no more conviction of sin. Again, ancient Richards tells this story. In the north of England, years and years ago, they had been digging coal for many generations. Miners went down into the tunnels miles and sometimes miles away from the main shaft. There was always a danger of becoming lost, and once two old miners did lose their way. Their light finally went out. They were in danger of losing their lives. After wandering around for a long time, one of them sensed a light touch on his cheek. <clears throat> he sprang forward, exclaiming, I felt it. They pressed on in the direction in which the air was moving and so reached the shaft. So there comes a time on which the Spirit of God, like a breath, touches your soul. Maybe gentle, faint. You can hardly recognize it, but friend, do not disregard it. Thank God that He has spoken to you, convicted you of your sins, convinced you of the righteousness of His commandments. In the light of His truth, give yourself to be led by the Spirit, and you will come out of darkness, out of bondage, out of sorrow, into the light of obedience. The Holy Spirit cannot lead us into truth unless we're willing to be led. Tim Rosenthal tells of an experience he and some of his family had years ago here in Arkansas. They were avid outdoorsmen, probably still are. But something went wrong that evening, that night, and some one of their party was injured. It was in the winter in the northwestern part of the state. I believe it was near the Buffalo River system. They were cold and wet and had endured hours of taxing discomfort before they were finally rescued. Before they were rescued, uh, they tried to find some way uh, to make things better. After several failures, they succeeded in lighting a fire. How carefully they tended that fire. They hovered over it and protected it from the wind. At length, it blazed up brightly, illuminated their dismal surroundings, warmed their cold bodies. They realized as never before what a friend a fire can mean. Let us not forget the metaphor of the apostle. Quench not the Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5.19 Let us be careful not to put out the fire which the Holy Spirit of God lights in our hearts. Amen. Notice that the, what the Spirit does. The Spirit speaks, 1 Timothy 4.1. Teaches, 1 Corinthians 2.13. Bears witness, Romans 8.16 makes intercession, distributes gifts, invites the sinner. After the day of Pentecost, the gospel was preached with the Holy Spirit sent down from heaven, 1 Peter 1.12. The Holy Spirit is the source of power for God's people. It is through the Holy Spirit that Jesus fulfills his promise. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And here's a warning from uh, the words 
of the apostle himself in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 30. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Back in the days before the flood, the whole world grieved the Spirit of God. And the Lord said, we're reading from Genesis chapter 6 verse 3, My spirit shall not always strive with man. The limit was reached. The flood came and swept that world completely away. But God's Spirit never ceases His striving with man as long as there's hope of His salvation. David's prayer was, Cast me not away from Thy presence and take not Thy Holy Spirit from me. Psalm 51 verse 11. Friend, is God's Spirit striving with you? At youth camp, um, Several years ago, um, a young lady had a long list. She came to the meetings and she had a long list of questions for the evangelist. That night, the Holy Spirit spoke to her heart as it did to many others. At the close of the meeting, she came to the minister and said, Pastor, I do not need to discuss those questions with you now. I was the problem myself. But I have found Christ who is the answer to all of life's questions. Friends, let us realize that we are our own worst problem. Amen. And when we make our full decision, our full consecration, yes, our full surrender, then God can use us in service and make our lives a blessing. Jesus said, that as parents know how to give good gifts to their children, so our Heavenly Father will give you the Holy Spirit if you ask Him. Luke 11, 13. So let us ask and let us receive. As a way of conclusion, I want to share with you a short series of verses that put together tell a definition or a formula, if you will, a, or the mechanics of the Holy Spirit's reception and continued indwelling. Let's turn in your, in your Bibles to John's Gospel, chapter 1. This is the King James. And you know, the ones that know me know that it's my favorite. Um, because even despite the old English, it's complete. And it's from the received, received text. Words are not left out. And words are not changed. In the beginning, starting with verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Look at verse 14. And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 12. But as many as received Him, to them He gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. Mm -hmm. I turn a page or two forward to John's Gospel, chapter 3. Let's start with verse 7. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Verse 8, the wind blows where it lists, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but cannot tell whence it cometh, and whether it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. A few more pages forward to chapter 6. Chapter 6, it's a long chapter. And uh, look at verse 63. And Jesus says, It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profit, nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. Now let's go to 1 Peter uh, 1.23. This is our final our final 
text? And what does it mean to be born again? The Bible tells us what it means. And here's another definition. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. By the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Now the God of peace, that brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. 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 And he goes God.